And um, hello, everybody. That's a lot of you there. Lovely to see you all. <laughs> Great. Um, well, as you've, as you've read and, and know, the, the theme of this conference is about loving the land. So I'm going to just say a few brief things that are close to my heart about it uh, to share some things with you. Um, love has been well identified by many of our ancient forebears, including the Orphic mysteries, the Orphic mystics in the mysteries, and Jesus Christ, of course, and St. John the Beloved, as being what is called God, which is that which continually creates, sustains, and transforms the universe. I mean, this is a big thing to think about. This love is more than just an abstract transcendent principle, but is also very real and imminent, present not just in each human being, but also in the whole world and indeed the whole universe. It is something that is fundamental to all human beings and to all forms of life, including, I might add, what scientists tend to call inanimate forms of nature. The fact that we tend to overlook the value of love or not value it as it should be valued, or sometimes not even be aware of it, let alone express it, is our fault, not love's. Yet its value far exceeds anything economic or mercenary. We just haven't yet learned to realize and know all that it is capable of doing. I also believe, like the philosopher Francis Bacon, that all nature, animate and inanimate, is imbued with mind or consciousness, and thus capable of loving and being loved. Also, as Bacon pointed out, I believe that love is the summary law of the universe, the universal law, life force and energy of the universe that creates and animates all things, is imbued with wisdom and brings order out of chaos. Sometimes, to me at least, it beggars belief that many scientists are still searching for the one universal law that underlies all things and from which all other laws are derived. Yet it actually stares us in the face if we dare but see it, as well as having been told it so often. But of course, to see it, understand it and know it are not the same things. To know this love, one has to experience it, which means practicing it. In scientific terms, such practice is usually done as experiments in different situations and locations to see what is truly love and what isn't until we perfect the practice. Jesus proclaimed this universal law of love as the double truth, a law that requires us in order to practice it, to love God, who or which is love, and to love our neighbors. One could translate this into loving the immortal, which we usually can't see, and loving the mortal, which we usually can see. Moreover, our neighbors are not just our immediate family and friends or other human beings, but also our whole environment, both natural and spiritual, mortal and immortal, in which we dwell and upon which we are dependent. The natural we can touch, taste, smell, hear and see with our own physical senses. The spiritual requires the equivalent inner senses of feeling or sensing a presence, hearing intuitively and seeing clairvoyantly. But some of us, maybe many of us, have developed to some extent these spiritual as well as natural abilities. One of the main things that I have learnt in my experience of all this, which I would like to share with you, is that if we approach someone else or some place in a loving heart-based consciousness and then listen intuitively, attuning ourselves to that person or place, we will expand our intuitive awareness and start to hear the inner voice of that person or place we are attuning to. Expand this further and we will start to hear the inner voice of nature all around us, or even the voice of the whole world, maybe even the universe. That inner voice or vibration of love will speak to the mind and stimulate the imagination, by means of which we can then start seeing the inner reality, as well as seeing at the same time the outer reality with our physical eyes. 
When this happens, we can then start marrying the two, marrying heaven and earth, immortal and mortal, by means of the loving service we can give. Another thing I would like to share with you from my experience is that if you love a place, that place will respond with its love, just like loving a person and being loved in return. Moreover, just as such loving can bring out the best in a person, it can also do so in a place. I have noticed that if one visits a place over and over again, loving it in whatever way you can or that feels appropriate, that place will begin to become a loving place. It acquires a presence of love. Now I hear and see these presences of love as angels. Such places then become holy places, oracle centers, like temples, filled with the presence of God, which is love. And such places can be man-made, like churches or temples, stone circles or shrines. But any place in nature, such as groves of trees, hills, mountains, valleys, wells, spring sources, and so on, they can all become holy places. The more love and attention we can give them, the more they respond in love and the holier they become. Each holy place, small or large, has an angel, the spiritual form of the presence of God. They simply appear or manifest themselves when that place becomes holy. Moreover, they will act as spiritual guardians of that place. It is similar to when in a marriage ceremony, a couple make their marriage vows. If it is done in real love, each loving the other, then an angel of that marriage appears, and I've seen them. An angel that will act as a guardian of the marriage, helping to maintain and strengthen the love and the promises made, whatever the challenges, because there are always challenges. The angel will remain as guardian of that, of, as guardian of that marriage and as a source of inner guidance until the couple might decide to end the marriage. The important thing then, of course, is to thank the angel and allow it to depart. So it is a simple secret. Anyone can create a holy place and manifest an angel, the presence of God or love. We can do it with our own homes, our gardens, but also anywhere we feel called to go. Think about that. We usually develop favorite places just as we make special or favorite friends. But the challenge is also to go further afield and love other places, as well as other people and other living forms of nature. And pilgrimage to places adds to this. A true pilgrim loves the land he or she walks on and travels through, giving love and receiving love, giving thanks and receiving thanks. We can turn such pilgrimage routes into pathways of light for love, when expressed strongly enough, starts to make people and places and pathways shine with light. This light is beauty, real beauty. It is a presence. It is both healing and inspiring, as well as lovely and loving. Such beauty, as we all know, is a pure joy. Moreover, beauty is not a monoculture. It is a multiculture of different forms and colors, geometries and purposes, peace, places and people grouped in harmonious ways. This is something to celebrate and enjoy and help create wherever and whenever we can. There is an ancient saying that there is unity in diversity and diversity in unity. I would add to this that there is beauty in diversity and diversity in beauty. Beauty is all one, and yet it is composed of many.
There are different geometries and patterns underlying all nature, including the land. Nature grows in all its abundance according to all these various geometries and tries to manifest each of them as beautifully as possible. Plants and flowers are the obvious examples, but they are to be found in every creature, including the human being, and also in the land, in different parts of the land and areas of the world. There is an underlying wisdom in all this, and humanity has been developing a slowly evolving science regarding it, sometimes forgetting it, and sometimes recovering what it has forgotten, and then developing the science further. We live in such times, having forgotten much, but now remembering and rediscovering much and developing things further. Ultimately, the whole world could become a holy place, utterly beautiful, shining as a temple of light, receiving our love and giving its love in return. We could then live in joy, a joy which is what peace ultimately means. Right now, in these times we're living in, we've been given an extra chance or motivation to do this, to love each other, to love the places we're called to, to love the routes we take to do this, to love the variety of patterns and energy systems that make up this world, and thereby, seemingly against all odds, create a fabulously beautiful world, a paradise on earth filled with joy. It, it, it takes effort, of course, and huge efforts are required now. But the efforts required are efforts of love, and undoubtedly the response will be huge. So my wish for each of us is that we may find this joy by loving each other, loving our homes, loving our environment, loving the land, bringing out the best in each other, in the land, in nature, so the whole world becomes a paradise filled with joy. Thank you.